Welcome to Striving for Consensus, Current and Future Management of Paroxysmal Nocturnal Hemoglobinuria. This is medical oncologist, Dr. Neil Love. For this program, I met with three clinical investigators, Drs. Carlos De Castro, Alexander Rote, and Eileen Weiss for a think tank discussion on relevant data sets and their perspectives on current and future management of patients with PNH. To begin, Dr. Rote comments on the diagnosis. Diagnosing PNH is always a challenge. I mean, for me, in, in the position here at the university setting where you get patients referred to you with a diagnosis of PNH, um, it's not that often that I, that I have the chance to, to do that. that. However, I remember a case actually of a patient who got um, all the clinical pictures of all the aspects of PNH with uh, abdominal pain, renal failure, hemolytic activity. And um, his, his nephrologist actually, what he did, he put all those terms, used all these terms and asked Dr. Google. And Dr. Google came <laughs> up with the diagnosis of PNH. And the guy wow. called me and said, man, it could be, it could be PNH. And usually that isn't not the case. But when he came in and we um, did an analysis and it takes like one hour or so to get the flow cytometry done. And we could actually really prove that the, that the patient had PNH. And uh, so this is, was an interesting story. And it's always important to look at all those various pictures and, and features of PNH and question and, and to do the flow cytometry to really rule out or rule in PNH. And that, that's, I think that's really important. And also the disease changes over time. So sometimes you only have mild symptoms, um, a little bit fatigue, and then you get infection, you get hemoglobinuria, and, and this maybe drives the patient to, to, get, like, to, get, to go to the doctor and get probably the work, proper workup and, uh, and the diagnosis of, of PNH. So, but we have, we remember, I remember patients who took, it took like eight years for them to be diagnosed with PNH because nobody thought about it. And, and the diagnosis of flow cytometry was not readily available in all the, those places. So, but this has definitely changed. I think the awareness is getting better and better. And, um, and, and, and we, and, and if you think about PNH, it's easy to, to rule it out or in with, with flow cytometry, which is, uh, which is really good. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, I, I always review the uh, CVs of all the faculty, and I noticed more and more I see uh, AI in the publications that people are getting involved. That's an incredible anecdote. Uh, Carlos, any pearls for fellows or people just coming into practice, with clinical pearls about making the diagnosis? Are there any things to sort of look out for that can kind of red, bring up a red flag that maybe people should be aware of? Yeah, I, I think that's a great point that it's it's a little bit difficult to make this diagnosis in part because they present to their uh, primary cares they don't even come to the hematologist initially and you know they've got dark urine so they get sent to urology or they've got chest pain they get sent to uh, either GI or cardiology so they get sent all over and unless you've heard of the disease which because it's so rare most people have never experienced it, it it's very hard to think about PNH you know for our fellows uh, these patients present usually in uh, one of three ways. Either they have the hemolytic anemia with the dark urine and hemoglobinuria, uh, or they have cytopenias, uh, which can be anywhere from severe to mild, or they have a blood clot that, uh, you know, in a young person that you just don't think, hey, why is this person getting a blood clot? And we, we even send off these thrombophilia workups, and you, a lot of them don't have PNH as a, as a test in those thrombophilia workups, so we're searching for rare diseases and leaving that one off. So uh, yeah, that's a really interesting in terms of the diagnostic uh, flow. So Eileen, I was going to ask you how just to begin to get into the pathophysiology and the biology of this syndrome, and even the normal uh, biology of the immune system, as particularly as it relates to complement. But maybe you can make it even more basic and start with how you even explain it to patients. <laughs> um, well, actually, um, you can. <laughs> Um, I think the complement system is what's driving this disease. And um, so patients, it, it's not an easy system to explain to patients 
But it's basically a very primitive system that is used to pr protect us from pathogens. That pathogen can be a bacteria, that pathogen can be a virus, that pathogen can be a uh, dead and dying cell, a cancer cell. Any of those can trigger off the complement cascade. And it's, it's an a system, an enzyme system, where one enzyme then amplifies another enzyme, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, leading to the generation of terminal complement, which the job of which is to punch a hole in a membrane. And hopefully that's your bacteria, the bacteria or the virus, it's not your endothelial cell or your red cell or your platelets. So. Um, and then I explain to patients that the amplification part, the, the system has a way of amplifying itself. And so, uh, and with the deposition of a particular protein on the cells, C3B, complement protein B, 3B, um, that helps clear out the bacteria, it helps clear out the viruses and the dead and dying tissues, but it also is the quarterback. It kind of amplifies the system, and then once the system's amplified, you generate lots and lots and lots of terminal complement. The goal of the, many of the new drugs is to prevent that system from amplifying and spinning out of control. That was a that was a great job. That was really excellent. I was I was just flashing last year. We were doing a program. I asked Rich Stone from Dana Farber how he explains uh, MDS to his patients, and he says it's like I tell him it's like a factory where all the people working there are drunk. <laughs> Anyhow. <I guess>. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so um, you may be sort of taken up to the next level in terms of pathophysiology, Alexander. Can you talk a little bit more, you know, kind of moving towards the fellow and uh, early uh, oncology uh, provider, uh, a little bit more about the path your vision of the pathophysiology of this disease and also how that pathophysiology sort of leads into the various clinical manifestations that you see? I think um, PNH has taught a lot about uh, the, the consequences of the intravascular hemolysis, which happens uh, or with the affected PNH red blood cells. So they are not able to protect them against the complement systems they attack, and there's the formation of the ultimate um, last step of the complement cascade, which is the uh, the formation of the membrane attack complex. And this, and, and, and actually, only one membrane attack complex is, is, is just a huge pore, actually is sufficient to destroy a red blood cell. So this causes an influx of, of uh, water and uh, the, the cell is swelling and, and gets destroyed and releases all its its um, content. And, and and most of it, it's, it's, uh, it's um, uh, in part toxic to the body, in at least in this amount and in this um dramatic um, manifestation. So um, so that's what happens in PNH. And uh, I think with the, the release of heme free hemoglobin, all our protection mechanisms are, um, are limited. And there's uh, the depletion of nitrous oxide, which is um, which in ultimately causes all the mentioned um, complications, like the risk for thromboembolic events um, the abdominal pain, which could be leading for some patients, or even like uh, problems, swelling, dysphagia, um, um, and, and the, the hemoglobinuria, which gave the disease actually its name. However, this is not only that's that's not typically present in all of the patients, um, at least not at the time of the primary diagnosis. So it's uh, it's really fascinating, and I, I think we we really learned a lot from the consequences of intravascular hemolysis. And this is not only relevant for PNH, but also for other hemolytic diseases. Eileen, you had a comment? Yeah, Alexander and I disagree a little bit about this. And I think that while intravascular hemolysis is important and free hemoglobin has consequences, that's what's not what it's not what's driving the complications in PNH. We know that chest pain is probably pulmonary embolus. We know that abdominal pain is microvascular thrombosis in the abdomen. And if you look at the South Korean regis 
trajectory data, hemoglobinuria itself, unless it's combined with the LDH, isn't a risk factor for thrombosis. So there's a lot more in terms of uh, the thromboembolic complications, and the only way we learned this is through inhibiting complement. So um, I want to, again, try to keep this, at this point, mainly relevant to the general medical oncologist and fairly basic before we get into more detail. But I want to get back to you, Carlos, to just pick up again as we talk more about the pathophysiology to help kind of put the pieces together. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what Alexander was saying about nitrous oxide, like sort of how, sure. what happens there and how it leads to clinical syndromes? Yeah, so when the red cells are lysed in the vessel intravascularly, they release free hemoglobin into the bloodstream. And that free hemoglobin will bind to nitric oxide and squelch it out of the system. Nitric oxide is usually important in controlling a smooth muscle tone. And when you squelch it out, you get constriction of your smooth muscle. And that can occur in the GI tract, so you may have difficulty swallowing. Uh, it can tr occur in the abdomen, so you may feel abdominal pain in addition to having a microvascular thrombi, as, as Eileen mentioned. Uh, so a lot of the symptoms that we see when patients have flares are directly related to that, uh, that uh, squelching of the nitric oxide out of the blood. That's really interesting. Any, uh, do we know anything about sort of what leads to like more hemolysis and more nitrous oxide, more symptoms? And is there any characteristic to the symptoms themselves in terms of the timing that might help differentiate that it's from this? Well, I think the, the, it's a little complicated because some patients have what we call type 2 cells that are only partially deficient in GPI anchors, and they tend to have a little less hemolysis and more of the other manifestations such as cytopenias. But if you have a large clone size uh, and your red cells are being affected by that and you get a complement activating event such as an infection, although it can be almost any stressor can raise complement levels, uh, you can really see the hemolysis much more briskly uh, in, in those patients and they become much more symptomatic then. So let's talk a little bit, again, at a basic level before you really start diving into the data, but more at a macro level in terms of the type of interventions uh, that have been uh, developed. And Eileen, maybe you can just talk a little bit about, I guess, the uh, I get the major strategy that's at least initially used in terms of uh, antibody therapy. So before there was any um, pharmacologic intervention, uh, it was just best supportive care, which was pretty unsatisfactory, and most of these patients died, and they died of complications, most often thromboembolic complications, but renal failure, stroke, etc. cetera. Um, and with the advent of complement inhibition, that's really changed the uh, the outcome for these patients. And the, the first complement inhibitor, which all of us participated in um, in the studies, was uh, a C5 inhibitor. And um, C5 blocks the generation of terminal complement. What they didn't appreciate was that while you block terminal complement, so you didn't get hemolysis, one of the cleavage proteins of C5 um, C5A is a very potent inflammatory protein and prothrombotic protein. And by blocking that, they dramatically reduced the symptomatology of fatigue and they dramatically reduced the incidence of thrombosis. So I'm curious, uh, Alexander, you know, what, does, what happens when you use these drugs clinically to these patients as you start them? Uh, what do you see? First of all, any tolerability issues that come up as you uh, treat them initially? And what do you typically see in terms of their clinical response? Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And looking back at uh, the first use of ecolizumab in one of my PNH patients, I actually have this as a case here. Um, it was it was dramatic because we were able to see that we can reduce hemolytic activity. How, unfortunately, LDH has a long half-life, so it takes some days and weeks actually to, for the LDH to come down and to even normalize. And, and with that, we are able to stabilize the hemoglobin 
or even improve hemoglobin over time. So this is this was really striking. And and just imagine at the time those patients needed blood transfusions every three to four weeks, two to three blood units. And this was was really traumatic and surprising. And of course, the, also the patient felt better. Um, maybe we underestimated the role of this, uh, but um, fatigue has plays an important role for patients with hemolytic disease, and and and, and especially if these are these are young, and, and often this is limiting their daily life, and even and the ability to work. So, um, in, in most of the patients, dramatically improved their fatigue and and normalized or even normalized or nearly normalized their, their level of fatigue in this situation. So this was was really striking. Ever since. Uh, we improved um, the the this um, the, the hemolytic activity and the response, and uh, after eculizumab, there was this long working antibody, uh, where we had um, the chance to reduce the the treatment burden from every two weeks to every eight weeks, which was another success, another generation, and another important uh, thing for patients affected with PNH, and um, and ever since this has this is, is going on. So I want to bring up a couple issues that came up, Carlos, when you and I did that initial program. Um, and we'll, Eileen, we'll get to you in one second. I just want to bring these things out on the table first. You mentioned a couple things in that initial program I just wanted to bring up in this conversation just to you know, kind of get the other faculty's thoughts also. The issue of pregnancy in these patients and also the issue of meningococcal infections. Um. Uh, and just to reiterate, symptomatically, when, when eculizumab came out, uh, there was dramatic symptom improvement in these patients. Uh, I mean, it was labeled as life-changing. Some were able to go back to work where they hadn't been able to. Uh, it really did make a huge difference. But there were some issues that came up later. And I think right now we're still trying to find the, the perfect drug for, for treating these patients with different targets in the complement system. And we'll get into this, I think, further on. Um, so uh, back to your question in terms of... Uh, Meningococcal, uh, meningococcal infections, infections and pregnancy yeah. and pregnancy and pregnancy were two issues. Yes, so pregnancy was always a huge issue for patients prior to complement inhibitions. Uh, the, there was a higher incidence of maternal mortality, fetal mortality, and we were actively uh, discouraging PNH females from getting pregnant. And a lot of that had to do with just that the thromboembolic risk went so high between both the pregnancy and the PNH uh, that they there was. Uh, higher instance of clots uh, because of that. Once we had eculizumab and we still didn't know, you know, could we give that drug safely into pregnancy? We now have enough of a case series where we all feel uh, fairly confident that we can, that it doesn't cross the placental barrier and doesn't get into breast milk. So that patients with PNH, uh, young females can have successful pregnancies uh, with a much lower risk now um, uh, when treated with eculizumab. And I think that is going to be coming out for, for, you know, the other complement inhibitors that are out there in terms of, can they be used successfully in pregnancy also? Um, in terms of meningococcal infections, um, we knew right from the start that this would, could be an issue and everybody has to be vaccinated against uh, meningococcal, uh, disease. Uh, there's two vaccines, the, the serotype B and then the serotype ACWY. And we recommend that, that uh, these patients get both of those before they start drug or uh, soon after starting drug. And even with those, there are, are, there's not 100% uh, um, risk-free of, of developing a meningococcal infection. So these patients need to be educated about the signs and symptoms. They should all be carrying their little card around that says, hey, if I come into the ER, I know you haven't heard of my disease, but please remember it can cause meningitis and uh, start treatment immediately for that. Eileen, uh, you had a comment and anything you want to add to what Carlos just said? Um, yeah, I think that pregnancy is a big issue for these patients. These are very young patients. And so, and we, we don't have any data that's published on the long acting C5 inhibitor or any of the new C5 inhibitors. And we certainly don't have any data on either the C3 or the iptacopan, the factor B or factor D inhibitors. So I think that's going to be a really big issue for patients because otherwise we have to switch them back to eculizumab. So I think uh, one other thing I wanted to say was that, you know, in terms of symptomatology, fatigue was always a 
a big issue for these patients. And the data really does suggest that it, it doesn't correlate with the degree of anemia. And when we, when we looked at the TRIUMPH study, which was randomized, placebo-controlled, blinded, uh, everybody knew who was on which drug, even though the patients could be, um, could be transfused up to a hemoglobin of 10. So it wasn't the transfusion that made the placebo arm better, because they didn't get better. But it was the complement inhibition that clearly improved um, the fatigue aspects. And so everybody knew who was getting the study drug versus the placebo drug. So that was pretty obvious. And we also know that this is probably cytokine mediated. It's not just the hemoglobin. I'm so glad you made that comment. I feel like we talk about fatigue all the time. It's just such an important issue in oncology and a lot more complicated than it might seem. Let's, again, at a very basic level, we're going to get much more detail, but just sort of as an overview, um, Alexander, can you comment a little bit about the complement inhibitors that have been tested, that are now available, that are in development? And just from a macro point of view, before we start looking at the data, kind of what the differences are in terms of activity, tolerability, schedule, and method of administration, just broadly. <laughs> That's a big question. Yeah, and, um, yeah, and thir in 30 seconds or less, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to, to do my best. I mean, as, well, as we mentioned, we started with Ecolizumab, and this was Z5 inhibitor, and, and the second generation was Ravulizumab, which is proved, approved for PNH. And this had the advantage that it's a recycling antibody with a long half-life, and, and, and this has become probably the standard of treatment now for symptomatic patients with PNH in, in, in Germany or in Europe. And novel substance and novel compound, as we realized that, um, um, and as Eileen already mentioned, that PNH red blood cells still get coded or get coded due to the, the thermal complement inhibition with early phases of complement C3 and, and um, uh, causes extra vascular hemolysis. So a certain degree of remaining anemia um, is caused by extra vascular hemolysis, which is new. That's not, not something which is the natural biology of PNH. Usually there's only intravascular hemolysis, but it's caused by our, our thermal complement inhibition. And, um, and the C3 inhibitor, Pexetacoblan, which is not an antibody, but a, 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 a cyclic peptide, uh, is able to block C3. And with the blockade of C3, we are able to improve and almost eliminate extra vascular hemolysis and see a further improvement of the reduction of hemolytic activity and a further improvement of hemoglobin. But this is another uh, uh, treatment strategy. It's given sub-Q uh, twice of, or three times a week. And depending on the response, it's in Europe it's approved for patients who remain anemic uh, on, on a standard treatment for over three months. So, Carlos, I was just flashing on a similar conversation uh, or program we were doing on bispecifics in lymphoma. And again, you know, we we're just, you know, from the point of view of the general medical oncologist, just trying to say, like, well, what's the difference, you know, whatever. And they, and they want to jump into all the data. And we're like, well, just tell us the basic difference. So you did a great job when we talked a little bit uh, there, Carlos, in terms of the agents that are approved right now. And also you talked about a second type of agent, but can you, can you go through both so, of these types yeah. of uh, drugs that are used, which one is approved? And again, from a very macro perspective, yes. the broad differences. So yeah, broadly, you know, we have our terminal complement inhibitors, which tend to uh, block C5. Uh, there are eculizumab and ravulizumab, as mentioned. Uh, we'll talk a little bit in the future about crevalimab. And there's some others that are out there too. And then we've you know, started to move into the proximal system, which includes the C3 inhibitor, Pexita Coplan. Uh, there are uh, the factor B inhibitor, which is Iptocopan. There's the factor D inhibitors, um, uh, which some have come and gone, but uh, Denicopan is still out there. Um, some are being combined with uh, C5 inhibitors. Uh, there's even now a um, um, MASP inhibitor that's going to come out or being clinically tested now. And there's other people that are engineering proteins to, uh, to bind both the, uh, 
the proximal and terminal system and try and block them both simultaneously. Uh, there are differences in how they're administered, the schedule of administration, uh, the convenience of administration. Uh, Iptacopan is now oral, denicopan will be oral. Um, there are sub-Q forms that can be given at home, but are others that have to be given by a pump. And so it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out in terms of what the patients want, what they prefer, what the doctors want. And finally, there's the, the cost issue because all of these drugs are uh, listed as ultra-orphan drugs and have an incredible expense with them. And which ones the insurance companies are going to uh, help to, to, to provide is going to be interesting too. So. Yeah, it was interesting. And when we were talking about that, you know, my I think most people's reaction was like, wow, that's a lot of money to be spending for one patient. But I guess you were pointing out that insurance companies look at it, there are not that many patients compared to like breast cancer, where you have moderately priced drugs, but you're using yeah, a lot correct. of patients. So kind of interesting there. Can we just dig yeah. a little bit more into the types of C5 inhibitors that there are right now that are approved? I think there are a couple that probably or may be approved in the near future, what the difference is, and a little bit about what you think the difference is going to be clinically in terms of how, like you said, patients and docs respond to different issues, method administration, et cetera. Sure. So uh, eculizumab was the first one that was FDA approved um, now a long time ago. It's a monoclonal antibody given intravenously. Uh, there's a loading phase where you give it weekly for four weeks, and then the maintenance phase where it's given every two weeks. And in general, these have to be given in either infusion centers or in the clinics. Um, occasionally, you can give it through a, a home uh, infusion company too, but uh, for the most part, they have to be given in the in the uh, physician setting or in a treatment room setting. Uh, ravulizumab was a modified form of eculizumab, they, they increase the half-life as mentioned. So now we can give it uh, as a loading dose uh, two weeks apart and administer it intravenously every eight weeks. And that was a huge convenience issue for patients. And there is you know, some data that we get higher levels and better blockade with, uh, with ravulizumab, but the studies were non-inferiority studies. We cannot really claim one was truly superior to the other. Uh, crevalumab, which uh, Dr. Roth has led a lot of the investigations in, is likely going to be FDA approved in this upcoming year. It is another monoclonal antibody that uh, used the so-called smart technology to engineer it. So it has a longer half-life and can be given in smaller volumes. And so it can be given subcutaneously. And as I mentioned, this can be done at home even. So the hope is it can be uh, avoiding some of the transfusion centers and visits that patients have to take. Uh, and that's it for the C5 inhibitors right now. There were some others that were in development, uh, one of which got approved for myasthenia gravis. Um, you know, it, it was looked at at PNH, but I think they decided uh, the field was too crowded, so they've dropped their studies there. So I won't mention them. So, Alexander, the term smart technology always catches my attention. Can you explain a little bit more about what, what curvolumab is and also, what happens when you treat patients with it in terms of tolerability, the schedule, what your thoughts are in terms of sub-Q? Yeah, that's a good question. So, crovalimab is also a C5 inhibitor, and the smart technology is mainly based on the properties of the antibody that it has to be fully loaded. So it means it binds all two C5 antigens and then is, is, is uptaken and it has also recycling properties. That means that d due to the affinity to the neonatal FC receptor, um, the antibody binds, it releases C5 because of the low affinity of C5 in the acid mal uh, milieu. And, uh, and then gets recycled, gets in, into the circulation again and can work again. So this is, a, this is that's modern antibody engineering, which is really amazing. Um, and, and, with that, and it's also amazing that we have this kind of recycling uh, properties now of our body and therefore um, enhances the, the half-life of the antibody. That's, this technology was also used for uh, ravulizumab. And um, but um, corvalimab has the, also the, the advantage that you can use low volume. This enables um, an easy uh, four, two two times two milliliters sub Q um, injection. 
and which is done. It was done in the clinical trials at ho- uh, in the center, and now it's done at home, which is really easy for the patients to s- self-administer um, their therapeutic antibody, and um, that's really amazing. And the loading starts with an, an 1,000 milligrams of IV dosing, and then weekly sub-Q dosing, uh, and the maintenance dose is uh, sub-Q every four weeks, which is easy for the patients. I think they love it, and uh, and they like to do it, and they're really satisfied to be independent of an uh, institution center and independent of any uh, visits to, to the doctor to get their treatment. So, Eileen, you know, we know there are a fair number of people who use our programs who have been in oncology or less, less, just for a few years. They're sort of new to oncology. And I was just sort of flashing on, you know, what happened with the uh, anti-CD38 antibody dar- daratumumab and myeloma, which initially they had to give IV. And the people were in there all day long with a prolonged infusion. Now they give it sub-Q, these, you know, like huge change in quality of life. Any thoughts again about uh, this new agent, uh, crivolumab, and uh, uh, you know, th- sort of again, if you could, you know, they are looking at patient-reported outcomes. Uh, I think prior to COVID, every a lot of people out there are like, oh, on college, you know, patients like to come to clinic, they like the nurses, et cetera. But I think maybe now we view it a little differently. Any thoughts about where this new agent might be heading? Well, one advantage of crivolumab is it does bind to a different site on the C5 molecule. So for that handful of patients who are totally refractory because they have a polymorphism in C5, that this is a better drug for them. Um, Hmm. Does it matter? Will the patients really care? Um, There was a trial looking at um, sub-Q infusion of ravulizumab, um, that ended up not being worth the effort. And um, so it, it's an option for patients. Um, does it have any advantages over uh, ravulizumab? Uh, probably um, not. It's probably um, non-inferior to ravulizumab. And so the issue is, is there, a, is there some other way to approach the disease other than just blocking at C5. Because all of these patients who are blocked at C5 will always have a component of extravascular hemolysis. And so there will be a certain percentage of patients that will always require transfusion. There's a certain percentage of patients that will always still be anemic because of their own inherent biology. So um, we're going to move on now in a second to uh, the presentations, but I just want to come back to Alexander and any thoughts or, let's say, predictions about where the field's going to be in three to five years? That's a good question. And personally, I think Aline already mentioned it, probably we are all moving to the early complement inhibition, uh, blocking the proximal complement cascade. And this has proven to be... Um, easier. It's an oral treatment. It's superior in response of hemolytic activity, improvement of hemoglobin, and even improvement of fatigue. Um, and uh, I, I think that's it's going to be a new a new generation of treatment. And, um, and 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 ultimately, and that's probably the best is that the patient is able to decide what is the best treatment for them and what fits best into their lifestyle and into their, their personal need. We have several patients who, and I always discuss it with them, who have normal, almost normal hemoglobin or normal hemoglobin on terminal complement inhibition, and um, they're getting their treatment every eight weeks with up and um, it's, it's, it, they, li- they like it, it's easy, you don't have to worry about uh, for eight weeks about your treatment, they're stable, uh, they're, they don't have any breakthrough hemolysis. This could be uh, a good treatment for them, but there are, of course, there are other patients out there who are, are anemic, need blood transfusions, have breakthrough hemolysis, are not that stable, and have significant fatigue. And of course, the new treatment strategies with proximal complement inhibitors would be ideal to 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 with them to get started and and, and to use to use it for them. So we will see. I think it's an it's going to be a more individualized treatment in the future. 
and I'm looking forward what can happen next. That's, that's our next step. What will be the next step after proximal complement inhibition for the treatment of PNH and if we are able to or cure or even, even further improve um, the, the, the treatment itself? Just final mm-hmm. comment uh, from Carlos again. Sure. You know, uh, Alexander was you know talking about sort of patient involvement in decisions, and this is a major theme throughout oncology. I think it always has been, but I think even more so. And I'm curious, you know, uh, in, in terms of pa- do you find that uh, patients are actually able to understand this, or the good patient uh, education resources out there, or the advocacy groups helping? Uh, what's out there supporting patients? Yeah, yeah, it, it is an interesting group in part because maybe it's such a a small group, but they're very cohesive and communicating through the internet. They have their own uh, support groups. It's kind of fascinating to watch uh, how the message gets out about things in this field. Um, and they do advocate. Uh, the Probably the best group for the patients, at least, is the Aplastic Anemia MDS International Foundation that supports patient conferences and uh, uses PNH as one of the subgroups that they study. Um, but there is other information out there, too. Um, so yes, it is. It they do advocate for themselves. Um, you know, we're we're trying to invent the, a better mousetrap when we have some good ones, but uh, there are some flaws in each of the treatments, and the hope is we can find something that's a, a little bit better. And we'll get into this in, in the future talks here about uh, side effects, complications. Do any of them have lower rates of breakthrough hemolysis, extravascular hemolysis, et cetera? And and so there are some issues here that with all these drugs. And, and I think in the end, none of these are curative in the sense these are going to be lifelong treatments. And as I mentioned, they're already very expensive. So I think the, the end point will be, hey, can we find some way that we can ever cure this disease? Do we have to work on the bone marrow failure aspect? Why do these cells arise? What keeps them in place um, in terms of uh, their clonality? And I think those are all future research topics that uh, we don't have answers for yet. All right, well, let's move on uh, to the presentation. For the initial talk, I'm going to turn this over to Eileen. Okay, so we're going to do an overview of the pathophysiology and the diagnosis and treatment. So this is one of my patients who's a lovely 29-year-old woman who presented with chest pain and shortness of breath. She actually presented nine months earlier with abdominal pain And then three months prior to the admission, she had a cholecystectomy for cholelithiasis. At the time she had the cholecystectomy, she had ascites, and she had a platelet count of 60,000. But they took out her gallbladder, sewed her up, and sent her on her way. Uh, Needless to say, she had persistent abdominal pain and then developed shortness of breath. Um, Her past medical history had been otherwise unremarkable. Same thing for the family history other than hypertension. On exam, the important things was that she had some scleral icterus. And on her abdominal exam, she had distension with ascites. Uh, she had bilateral edema. And when they evaluated the lungs with a CTPA, she had a PE in the left main stem pulmonary artery. And that actually extended uh, to the left lower lobe as well. She also had evidence of uh, a Bud Chiari and um, extensive thrombosis in the lower extremities. So what what is really important about her case is that her diagnosis, if someone had thought about it, could have been made at least three months earlier and maybe spared her the Bud Chiari. Um, her labs on admission, um, the pertinent ones, her hemoglobin was 9, her MCV was um, 93, um, her platelets were only 60,000, but her D-dimers were 4,000, so quite elevated. Her LDH actually wasn't all that high, but it was 780 with an R- in our lab, the normal is uh, 220. Um, Her bilirubin was elevated, her haptoglobin was low, and um, her B12 folate were normal, APLS workup was negative, and um, so uh, we sent a flow, and she had a pretty significant um, PNH clone at the time she presented to us. 
And here you can see your flow cytometry. So you can see this very large PNH clone, a negative, negative clone, um, lacking the markers for PNH. So she was CD59 deficient. And her, so her GPI anchors were absent. So we know that PNH is a rare acquired clonal disorder, and it, uh, it results from a mutation on the X chromosome. Uh, again, not inherited, it's a somatic mutation in the hematopoietic stem cell. So the pig A gene mutation leads to a decrease in or a total lack of GPI anchored proteins. The consequence is that you can't fix the inhibitors of complement, particularly CD55 and CD59, to the affected cells and their progeny. And so as a consequence, all of the PNH cells, and that includes the white cells, the red cells, and the platelets, et cetera, are more vulnerable to complement-mediated lysis through the terminal complement complex, leading to chronic intravascular hemolysis and hemoglobinuria, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, and thrombosis. There is a significant association with bone marrow dysfunction, which may contribute to the cytopenias. So why does this happen in patients with PNH? Because complement is driving the disease, and they're missing the regulators of complement. So um, the complement system is designed to protect us against a variety of different organisms, dead and dying tissues, et cetera. And the, the generation of C3B is, is the most important step in complement. And that, that's because C3B is the opsonization function of complement. It's also the amplification point of complement. So all of the different activating pathways lead to the generation of C3B. Um, and that includes antigen antibody, the lectin pathway, and also the alternative pathway. C3B can be inhibited by CD55, but that has to be bound to the membrane by a GPI anchor. Once you get C3B on the membrane, you generate bundles of C3B, so you make bundles of C5 convertase that converts the next protein to uh, to uh, C5, to C5A and C5B, and C5B fixes the terminal proteins, and that punches the hole in the membrane, as Alexander was describing. And uh, you can block that by inserting, uh, by CD50, uh, CD59, which interdigitates between the C9 molecules and prevents a hole from forming. Um, C5A, again, as I mentioned, is a very potent inflammatory protein and also a prothrombotic protein. And interestingly enough, it can be activated directly by thrombin. And it also is important in generating thrombin, leading to thrombosis. So here you can see the effect of the terminal complement proteins. Once you put uh, C3B on the membrane, then you can fix C5, then you can generate C5 convertase. You can fix C3B to the membrane, which then fixes C6, 7, 8, and then C9 circulates and has to be inserted into the membrane. It's actually very hydrophobic. If you have CD59 present, then it will block the insertion of these molecules. If not, then you will generate a pore in the membrane. And here you could see the, the micelle of C9. Here you can see all the holes in the red cell membrane. That will lead to hemolysis. Now, we know that complement really dries PNH and that um, it's important not just for hemolysis, but also for the generation of much of the other symptomatology. And it causes hemolysis with intravascular hemolysis. It also causes activation of the platelets and activation of the white cells that then cause cytokine release, platelet aggregation, and the 
the generation of, cl of clot by activating monocytes as well. If you look at the symptomatology, you get end organ damage, in, particularly in the kidney or in the lungs with pulmonary hypertension, although that may also be a consequence of the generation of clot, but smooth muscle dystonias, as I mentioned, but most importantly, thrombosis, which really is going to kill the patient. So this is my take on thrombosis and PNH. It's really the complement that's driving all of these processes, and it's injury to the red cell, causing hemolysis. It's in injury to the granulocytes, monocytes, platelets, and even the endothelial cells leading to thrombin generation. And C5A also leading to thrombin generation is what's causing thrombosis in PNH. All right, what happens when you block complement in PNH? And here you can see the effects of the C5 complement blockade. You reduce hemolysis, it improves the anemia, it reduces the transfusion requirement, it improves the platelet count in some patients, um, it reduces the markers of thrombin generation and the thromboembolic complications, it improves pregnancy outcomes, and it doesn't seem to wear off over time. So you can continue to block complement. Now we have 15-year data on using C5 inhibitors. And here you can see the data from the original ecolizumab study, uh, C5 inhibition using a monoclonal ecolizumab. And you could see that uh, once the patient started ecolizumab, the LDH, which was a marker of hemolysis, drops precipitously, and by four weeks, it's down, whereas in the placebo group, it stayed high. When the placebo group was then transitioned over to, um, to the study drug, you could take that curve and superimpose it on this curve. And that's true for the Japanese trial, the AGES trial, and also for the Shepard study, which was a 52-week safety study. So it's very reproducible. And here you could see these are uh, PNH type 3 clones, and you could see that they go up um, with inhibition of complement. What about thromboembolic events? Now, this was not a primary outcome of the study in the TRIAM study, but you can see the reduction from three, 39 events to three events. But more importantly, the p-value goes out six zeros. That could not be by chance. So there's no question that the inhibition of complement reduces the thromboembolic complications in this disease. So my second case is a pretty more classical one. Uh, this is a patient who's 48 years old, referred because of persistent anemia, presented in 2003 with pancytopenia and was diagnosed with aplastic anemia, treated with standard therapy, and achieved a remission. However, in 2006, she was noted to have anemia and was started on C5 inhibition and was referred to me for further evaluation. She had fatigue and she required transfusion every two to three weeks. And as you can see, patients with PNH can, ha can emerge out of aplastic anemia and go back into aplastic anemia. And so they can develop hemolytic PNH or they can stay as aplastic anemia. And the symptomatology is more likely to be related to hemolysis and to the complement activation in the hemolytic patients versus the aplastic patients. What happens with survival when you inhibit C5? And this was based on Sir John Dacey's original cohort that Pete Hillman looked at. And then this is the more, a more recent analysis of survival in the Leeds population. And you could see that there's really a significant improvement in overall survival with C5 inhibition. So 
do all patients respond to C5 inhibition? Well, obviously, this patient remained transfusion dependent. And in his analysis, Antonio Ricitano kind of classified patients based on their hemoglobins and their retic responses. Why don't you respond? It could be a polymorphism in C5, as we talked earlier. It could be due that efilucimab was a flat dose and not weight-based. Increased clearance of the antibody. Uh, ravulizumab has a much longer half-life than ecolizumab. There are breakthroughs due to infection or complement amplifying conditions like pregnancy, surgery, et cetera, et cetera. And increased extravascular clearance due to C3, C3B accumulation on the cells. Okay, and here you can see either you um, have residual intravascular hemolysis or you coat the cells with C3B and get extravascular hemolysis leading to persistent anemia. So people have started looking at alternative places to block the complement system. And uh, you can block at C3. You can block in the alternative pathway at factor B or factor D. And that will decrease the generation of C3B and the generation of C5 convertase. Okay, uh, C3 inhibition with pegcetacoplan. It's a cyclic decapeptide uh, inhibitor of C3, and it blocks the alternative pathway of complement. And here you can see the pivotal trial, the Pegasus trial, where when patients were, had overlapping therapy, they had pretty normal hemoglobins, and then they were randomized to stay, to stay on the PEG or to go back to their C5 inhibitor. The C5 group became more anemic again. Again, they had overlapping therapy, and then they were all transitioned to peg plan monotherapy and sustain their hemoglobins. And you could see that PEG was superior to ecolizumab uh, and uh, was certainly non-inferior in terms of freedom from transfusion. So this particular patient uh, went on peg cetacoplan actually on the original Feroa trial and, and then on the Pegasus clinical trial. And she was on PEG and transfusion independent since 2018. Um, her hemoglobins range from 10 to 11.8. She had a breakthrough with COVID, um, but she really had trouble giving herself injections after a while. And um, so she begged to go on an oral agent. And uh, so we were able to get her on Iptacopan on a compassionate use basis. And her most recent hemoglobin is 11.8 and our platelets of 86,000. And this is the data from the peg plan trial versus the standard of care, which was a C5 inhibitor. She wasn't eligible for the trial, so we had to get it on, because she was on PEG, and uh, we had to do it on a compassionate use basis. And you could see significant improvements, three gram improvements in the hemoglobins. And again, over almost all the parameters, there were, was improvement. So here you can see, uh, once all the patients were transitioned from a standard of care, C5 inhibitor to aptacopan, uh, they um, had normal hemoglobins. Uh, here are some of the other drugs, and I'm sure other people are going to talk about these. The Commodore trial, these drugs are not approved. Uh, they may be sitting at the FDA right now. Crivolimab, uh, Pozilimab, uh, Semdisaran, which has a, a small interfering RNA molecule. Danicopan, Vermicopan uh, is no longer going to be available wasn't effective as monotherapy, but danicopan is being looked at as an add-on therapy to C5 inhibition. It's a factor D inhibitor. Well, that was really awesome, Eileen. Thank you so much. It was really informative. Before we go on to the next talk, uh, just to stop in there with uh, Alexander, any thoughts about uh, Eileen's presentation, the two cases, anything she had to say that maybe you disagree with? No, I, nothing to disagree with. I mean, I will further extend on some of the data in detail, but um, everything's it's good. 
Well, that's great, Eileen. Perfect presentation. Uh, Carlos, anything you want to add to that? What about the two no. cases, Carlos? Any, um, were yeah. those typical cases or anything very, different very about those different. cases? In fact, I think I could have substituted some of my patients into there and said, hey, that's mine. Oh, what are you presenting <laughs> that for? Because those are very, very typical cases. Um, the patient that had complications after surgery ended up with Bud Chiari, the other one with aplastic anemia that eventually evolved into PNH. Uh, we see these cases coming to us all the time, yeah. The typical thing, maybe it's it's the hemolytic activity and not normal platelets. I think that's something you always have to think about PNH. I think that's something uh, which helps you to identify PNH. That's right. But that's it's, right. Not, yeah, it's not a rule, of course. Yeah. The only other comment I had would, would have been the, the role of anticoagulation. Obviously, when you presented with a clot, uh, that's our first thought. But uh, now that we have these complement inhibitors that whether we have to continue anticoagulation, what we do with it is has become an issue. Yeah, this patient stayed on anticoagulation um, and she's had a series of breakthrough with COVID and, and other infections. She's got young kids at home. So um, we've kept her on, even though her Bud Chiari had improved. So let's move on now and uh, get to uh, Alexander's talk. Okay. So thank you very much. So my topic is the future direction of PNH management. So paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So it's characterized, and we talked about already about it, about um, hemolytic activity due to intravascular hemolysis, some degree of bone marrow failure characterized by thrombocytopenia, and of course, and that's the main thing and relevant for morbidity and mortality, the risk for thrombosis. In involving also unusual sites like the liver or the brain. And um, standard treatment, of course, and that still remains somehow of the basic and backbone of the treatment of PNH is um, supportive care based on transfusions, supplementation of folic acid, phytamine to be 12 if deficient, and even also supplementation of iron if it's uh, deficient. Um, Bacterial infections can cause breakthrough hemolysis even with complement inhibition. So we really recommend early and consequent antibiotic tre treatment. And we also consider anticoagulation with severe hemoly hemolysis in untreated or breakthrough hemolysis. And I think one, one important thing is, what, uh, is that standard steroids, which we use for warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, uh, is not uh, an effective treatment, at least long term. So ravulizumab and eculizumab has become the standard treatment for symptomatic patients with PNH. This could be trans, uh, symptomatic due to transfusions, um, uh, due to thrombolic events, and in here it could be emergency situation in addition to anticoagulation, renal complications, abdominal pain crisis, long-term risk situations, and pregnancy, where the main data is based on the use of eculizumab. And um, maybe in the future, we also have uh, data on other co uh, complement inhibitors in this situation. Important patients have to be vaccinated, already mentioned, with the tetravalent conjugate vaccine, as well as the B vaccine. And those vaccines have to be repeated uh, based on, the, on, on local recommendations. And of course, you can still have a meningococcal infection because it's, uh, you have this deficiency and, and, and complement is blocked, which adds to the work of um, antibodies. And there's still a risk for breakthrough hemolysis uh, despite effective treatment. As Eileen already mentioned, um, the predictors, are, uh, the, the response to C5 inhibitor varies, and we also looked at our data, and only few patients actually normalize um, their um, hemoglobin with um, C5 in inhibition. And uh, relevant could be uh, levels of folic acid, iron, vitamin B12, bone marrow, the degree of underlying and bone marrow failure. Uh, degree of extra vascular hemolysis, also inflammatory conditions as, as chronic inflammatory bowel disease could affect also the, the response and cause breakthrough hemolysis. And so, and also genetic factors as well uh, as a situation or a condition of pregnancy. So this is actually the German, um, uh, Austrian, Swiss treatment algorithm. So we are also, we are able to differentiate leading aplastic anemia in this situation. Here we have the aplastic anemia guidelines for leading uh, hemolytic patients um, 
for asymptomatic patients, it's justified to follow the patient closely, consider prophylactic anticoagulation. For symptomatic patients, need for blood infusion, simulated crisis, uh, thromboembolic events, the standard could, would be ravulizumab, ideally, and uh, seldom now we, we would use uh, eculizumab. And for patients who continues to be um, anemic, we consider pex um as a C3 inhibition. So this is the schema of hemolysis and pedophysiology of, of PNH. So we have the defective PNH red blood cells who are not able to defend themselves from complement. The attacked and terminal complement cascade uh, forms the, this membrane attack complex leading to intravascular hemolysis. And the next step would be that um, with terminal complement inhibition, the PNH red blood cells remain PNH red blood cells and are, are coded with C3 and lies extravascularly, mainly in the liver and spleen. And, um, and with the new available drugs, Paxetagoblan and factor B and factor D inhibitors, the PNH red blood cells completely uh, protected and remain. But, but also we have to consider that this is also a new condition of the disease as we have accumulation of a lot of PNH red blood cells, which can cause severe uh, breakthrough hemolysis. And I think that's always important to remember if you, knew, knew, if you use new drugs, that we it generate a new condition of the disease. And this is an overview of the complement pathway and inhibitors. And you see there are a lot of drugs available and in the clinical development. So crovalimab, as I already mentioned, as a recycling antibody, you see and the mechanism of actions. Um, given its long half-life, high solubility and high bioavailability, it allows for low volume um, sub-Q um, treatment every four weeks. And, um, and Crovalimab was tested in uh, uh, free phase three trials. The Commodore studies, Commodore two was in naive patients. They were randomized to receive either Crovalimab or Eculizumab. Commodore three was uh, C5 naive patients in China. And Commodore one was um, patients with who were C5 experienced. And they, they were randomized to receive either Crovalimab or Eculizumab. And here are already results of those uh, trials. In Commodore 2, they were able to show non-inferiority of crovalimab to ecolizumab in control of hemolysis and transfusions avoidance. Commodore 3 also met both co-primary endpoints, and um, disease control was maintained with no new safety signals and additional six months of crovalimab exposures. And in Commodore 1, crovalimab was well tolerated some patients had transient immune complex reactions when switching to C5 eyes, and um, um, the disease control was maintained. So here, the efficiency, again, I don't want to go in detail. Um, Carvalimab showed non-inferiority to standard treatment with eculizumab and showed sufficient results for um, those endpoints mentioned here. Also here, detail of the one endpoint was hemolysis control um, uh, analyzed by LDH activity. And here see the proportion of patients with central LDH below or equal 0.5 times the upper limited normal. And this was equal to the standard arm of thermal complement inhibition using eculizumab, similar for mean normalized LDH. So also transfusions avoidance from baseline were similar for crovalimab and the eculizumab arm, proving the non-inferiority of, uh, of crovalimab compared to eculizumab. And again, it's always important to also talk about safety in, uh, if you talk about complement inhibitors. And um, in general, this was a well-tolerated uh, treatment. Um, um, side effects or complications were similar to the use of um, eculizumab. And, um, and uh, I think that's, that's quite similar. And we pretty much all know about how to deal with um, uh, eculizumab. So another substance that we already talked about is on the oral compound danicopan. We all were always dreamed about an oral treatment for PNH from the beginning of um, this availability of complement inhibition. So danicopan was used as an add-on to standard treatment um, of to ravulizumab or ecolizumab. And here are you the cells which were just published recently in the Lancet Hematology with uh, the, the, the mean actual hemoglobin over time or the change of hemoglobin from base 
baseline. And you see with the combination therapy in contrast to placebo, there was an improvement and, uh, and a nice improvement of uh, the combination of terminal complement inhibition with denicopan in, in, in comparison to the placebo arm. And the another point here in, in the complement cascade, which uh, is blocked, is semdesiran and potzelimab, um, which is an interesting approach. Those uh, um, RNA um, in the interaction blocks the formation of the target messenger RNA, RNA for um, C5 and is able to block the production of C5 in the liver. Unfortunately, there's also C5 in the production in other sites than the liver, like the endothelium, and so it's not completely it's not completely active as a monotherapy. Um, but um, as shown here, it's of course able to to block to and reduce effectively the formation um, of C5 protein in eco naive PNH and eco treated PNH patients based in, in, in a dose dependent manner. So, um, semdesiran cannot be used alone. It has to be combined with a C5 inhibitor, and potzelimab was used in, in clinical trials to use the, the efficiency. And uh, last not but least, uh, there's uh, silucoplan, which is also an interesting substance. It's also a protein, which blocks here and, and disrupts the formation of C5B and C6 therefore blocking the terminal complement cascade and in a dose dependent manner as shown here. And, and this is in clinical trials and in further investigations. So uh, with this, I would like to summarize and conclude that of course, despite all the advantages Diagnosing, management, and treatment of PNH still remains a challenge in in 2024. Um, the, there's a clearly a meaningful improvement of the management and the outcomes in PNH with terminal and novel proximal complement inhibitors. Pexetoglan is an improved proximal complement in, inhibitor in, inhibitor uh, for the treatment of PNH with persisting anemia. And uh, treatment is well tolerated with sub two infusions uh, with a standard dose of uh, twice twice weekly. There are novel uh, treatment options um, that are about to be approved: covalimab or ipecacuban. And um, new treatments, um, new treatment options in PNH give rise to new disease, new conditions. I think that's important for us to remember, uh, like the extra vascular hemolysis with terminal complement inhibition, as well as the risk for severe breakthrough hemolysis with proximal complement inhibitors due to the, the accumulation of, of P and PNH red blood cells. And with this, I would like to finish my presentation actually with, uh, with patient cases. So this is really amazing. So this was one of the first patients treated with ecolizumab in our, in our hospital. And you see it goes back to 2005 or 2004 where he was screened and randomized to the treatment. He had a significant LDH level of 2,400. And with the treatment, we were able to control um, um, his uh, hemolytic activity with some breakthrough hemolysis, which is uh, which is something we are uh, known and which were, was was a, a ch somehow a little, a little bit uh, a challenge to 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 deal with. However, and and here you see the response in in the hemoglobin. And I think the interesting point, even with all over those years of treatment, he, we are, were able to to control his hemolytic activity and further improve his hemoglobin. And he now reaches uh, normal hemoglobin levels. Um, uh, for uh, with this treatment, and, and he also that's the important message here. Actually, it's he, he is that the PNH clone remains the size remains the same from the beginning. So he's not a patient who had a spontaneous remission on on this kind of treatment. So it's it's amazing. We are able to continue the improvement over years of treatment, and he's stable and. I think this would uh, would be a challenging to change the treatment strategy at this at this time. Um, so the next case is a patient on crovalimab. So he was randomized and treated. You see the same response, elimination and reduction of PNH of the LDH levels, and uh, with improvement and almost near normalization of the hemoglobin over time. He's well confident with the treatment, and um, he really likes the home treatment with crovalimab. And I think also here. Um, there's probably no way or no need for changes. 
even uh, if, if the patient does not uh, want to change it. And um, here's my last case, patient number three, um, which was diagnosed with PNH in 2012. Again, here you see in gray the reduction and normalization of LDH with the treatment of eculizumab at a time point. And, um, and there was, uh, of course, we changed with availability of uh, ravulizumab. We changed the treatment into ravulizumab. And uh, this was a benefit in, in treatment-wise and in, 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 in respect of treatment burden. And then we switched to the proximal complement inhibitor, eptacopan, which is really impressive. And you see here the persistent elevated bilirubin as a marker of extra vascular hemolysis. So we were able to also to normalize not only the LDH, but also the bilirubin levels. And with that, and, and a reduction and elimination almost of the extra vascular hemolysis, we, we saw a dramatic further improvement of the hemoglobin and also um, the quality of life of this, of this patient. So this show clearly shows the, um, the evolution of um, PNH treatment in 2024 and 2024. And um, I think that's really promising and, um, and, and, and looking forward for having those drugs available and, and having those uh, treatment approved. This, with this, I would like to finish and I thank you for your attention here. So that was really incredible. It was so uh, useful, Alexander. In a second, I want to ask for uh, Eileen and uh, Carlos if they have any thoughts or questions. But I just wanted to ask, you know, the, the trial you were talking about there that compared carvalimab and eclizumab, uh, I know it was a non-inferiority trial. Do you think if it had been larger, you might have seen different? I noticed the numbers were a little bit different, or do you think that really that's just noise? I'm not sure if if it, higher numbers would have improved the. I mean, it it was uh, it was the, the the strategy was to show non inferiority. You cannot make more out of this, and oh, but already showing non inferiority to to a standard treatment with eculizumab is something, and and it's also important. I and and it's pro probably similar to the trials with ravulizumab in comparison to eculizumab. However, which what was not able to clearly show what is probably more relevant for those recycling antibodies that they usually give the patients more stability. So we see less, right. and you saw that with uh, with the patient which was, was first treated with eculizumab. We had those histories or in in, in 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 situations with breakthrough hemolysis, due to complement amplifying situations or due to also to dosing reg uh, schemes, and 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 this this was probably pretty much gone with all those uh, long acting and recycling antibodies, and it's pretty much the same probably for crovalimab. And all my patients on crovalimab they are pretty stable and we rarely see um, um, breakthrough hemolysis similar to patients on ravulizumab. But this was not a, the, this wasn't investigated in, in detail in, in the clinical trials. So I'm, I'm amazed too that just that you were able to actually able to do phase three trials in this disease. I was telling when I work with Carlos, I was mentioning we did a program on desmoid tumor, same thing that you know, unusual, rare tumor, but yet they pulled off a phase three trial. Incredible. Eileen, anything you want to add to uh, what Alexander presented, his cases, any thoughts? No, you know, the, the trouble is that all these trials are only looking at hemolysis. They're only looking at hemoglobin as an endpoint and transfusion avoidance. They're not looking at at any other biologic principles in PNH. So it makes it really difficult. There's no question that a C5 inhibitor is a C5 inhibitor. And uh, you're not going to get much more mileage out of that than you that, at that level. You're going to have to go to a completely different treatment to see a change in benefit. Carlos, any, uh, again, follow-up Yeah, let me ask my colleagues a question. So the Fazilimab Semtizaran study is, is fascinating to me. The idea being that you can knock down liver production so you don't have as much C5, and then you inhibit it with your monoclonal, and the hope being that they would have less chance of having breakthrough hemolysis during a complement-activating event. Uh, do you think that's really going to happen or, or not? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Because otherwise, it becomes if, two drugs that, that are acting at the same point. In sense. Right, because when you have a complement amplifying condition, the complement is magnified by 
multitudes, I mean, by millions, you're not going to be able to block everything down. And I, I just, I know from the original um, S, SIRNA trials um, that another company had, um, you just could not block it enough. So you really do so, have to combine it. And will that prove to be superior? I, I seriously doubt it. So, uh, Carlos, uh, let's uh, move on to your presentation on tolerability and other practical issues uh, with these therapies. Sure. All right. So the question that comes up is, as you've seen, we are moving forward with more and more complement inhibitors, which is uh, putting us in a difficult position of what do we advise our patients and which one should we use? Uh, there are now four FDA-approved complement inhibitors for PNH, and there's probably more on the way, as was mentioned. Uh, some target the terminal pathways, others are the proximal pathways. At least one is oral uh, of the approved drugs. The others are given IV or sub-Q at various intervals. Some may be better at achieving a higher hemoglobin level. It seems that uh, targeting the proximal pathway seems to get us higher hemoglobin levels. Breakthrough hemolysis is still a big issue. And the other considerations we have are side effects from these drugs, rates of infection, uh, rates of thrombosis, cost insurance coverage, and compliance issues with all these drugs. And my bottom line is we have a difficulty in comparing drugs because none of these are going to ever be randomized studies comparing one drug to the others. So we have to extrapolate from uh, small studies that are using these and hopefully following the patients long enough so we can sort of get some idea of the rates of different side effects or uh, infections or breakthrough uh, events. Um, you see here from the original eculizumab uh, study that the, uh, the side effect profile was very, very good. Uh, there were these headaches we saw with initial dosing that may be related to nitric oxide uh, manipulations. There was nasopharyngitis, a uh, small effect, upper respiratory tract infections that were probably equivalent in both groups, and back pain. And really, the drug was very, very well tolerated in terms of, of uh, what we saw. Now, there was always the risk of meningitis with it. And uh, I'll borrow this paper that uh, Dr. Roth was a senior author on, looking at the real-world data now on long-term outcomes of, of patients with uh, PNH treated with eculizumab. And there were 85 patients in the group from Germany, 76 of which had received eculizumab. They followed them for a medium of, of a little over five and a half years. Um, during the initial 24 weeks, there was still a need for blood transfusions. 8% had breakthrough hemolysis. 13% uh, actually had symptoms of breakthrough without the proof of hemolysis. Uh, and 8% developed extravascular hemolysis based on some stringent criteria that they developed. Uh, the 15% if you had some that uh, were missing data was excluded. So a fairly high percentage getting extravascular hemolysis. And then during the whole study period, which is up to 254 week, 41% developed extravascular hemolysis, again, with a fairly stringent criteria for def defining it. The overall infection rate was shown there. But interestingly, there were no meningococcal infections in that group. Uh, there were 18 major adverse vascular events. So giving it about a 4.24 events per 100 patient years, which is a little bit higher than some of the other studies have shown. And there were four deaths, um, which is fairly low. Uh, again, probably most of these were not related to the uh, complement inhibitor unless you put sepsis and septic shock in there. Uh, but again, small numbers, hard to tell. Uh, ravulizumab, uh, we have a publication uh, from, uh, from the England group. Um, and it was actually a multi-center group. Um, again, looking at registry data, two-year results uh, from the two pivotal phase three uh, trials. Uh, they looked at treatment emergent adverse events, and you see the numbers there. Most of these were mild. Uh, grade four was only 4.4% uh, uh, in, in one arm and 38 in the other. Uh, if you look at the number of major adverse vascular events, again, small uh, percentages, 1.4%, 1.2%. The most common treatment adverse events were very similar to what we saw with eculizumab, headache, nasopharyngitis, upper respiratory tract infections. And you see here the number of severe adverse events leading to discontinuation was very, very low. So again, a very, very well uh, tolerated uh, drug. Breakthrough hemolysis was uncommon. They wrote less than 10%. And over 40% of those breakthrough events were associated with an obvious infection. So a complementing activating event 
uh, leading to uh, hemolysis. Uh, I'm borrowing this from Dr. Ross' presentation at ASH. Uh, I appreciate the slides where he looked at the safety profile uh, between crevalumab and neculizumab. Um, and you see here, uh, serious adverse events was fairly low, um, but they did occur. Um, adverse events leading to treatment discontinuation, again, very, very low. And uh, uh, maybe 5% needing some sort of uh, dose modification or interruption of treatment. Um, they give us the number of serious infections being 7.4 per 100 patient years in the Coralab group, and uh, that compares to 14.1 of those receiving eculizumab. So maybe a reduction in infections, although I, I think the infections probably has nothing to do with the drug we give and are just random events that occur in this population. Um, patients with breakthrough hemolysis in the studies, again, showing it here, if you look at uh, uh, the percentage getting uh, breakthrough hemolysis, it seemed to be a little bit lower compared to eculizumab in these studies, but it still occurs. And so again, not having a perfect drug that has figured out this issue of breakthrough hemolysis, complement is very hard to knock down to the point where it won't be amplified and overcome your drug. They looked at their adverse events occurring across both crevalumab and eculizumab. There were no meningococcal infections reported in these studies. So again, showing that uh, vaccination and close observation seems to do well. And in terms of the uh, infection rates and the adverse event rates, they were very, very similar uh, comparing crevalumab versus eculizumab. Uh, Dr. Roth mentioned this briefly, but we did see this issue of transient immune complex reactions that occurred in these patients. This occurs because you're binding different epitopes on C5. And with that, you can get these formation of these transient immune complexes while you're switching from one drug to the other. So as long as the eculizumab is still around, it's binding to one epitope, crevalumab binding to another, and you can get these, uh, these larger uh, immune complexes. Interestingly enough, these were transient and fairly mild, consisting of rash, uh, and uh, really did not affect anything with the study, and they resolved fairly quickly within a couple of weeks. Uh, just to mention the modes of administration, and this was covered a little bit uh, earlier, eculizumab is given as a weekly loading for four doses, then every two weeks. Ravulizumab, as it was modified, can be given on days one and 15 for loading doses, then every eight weeks. Crevalumab, as was mentioned, has a loading dose of weekly, and then it goes sub-Q every four weeks. It can be given at home because of the small volumes. Pegacetacoplin is given sub-Q by a pump twice weekly, and they now have an on-body injector to hopefully make things easier on patients. Uh, Iptacopan is given orally twice a day. And denicopan, which hopefully will also be uh, talked about, is given orally three times a day with a C5 inhibitor, uh, in this case, most likely ravulizumab every eight weeks. Extravascular hemolysis is going to be a problem with all the C5 inhibitors. I don't think there's a way for them to get around that, um, and we'll just have to see how that works out but the proximal inhibitors do not have that same problem. Uh, just a study of pegcetacoplin that I presented at ASH for those receiving it up to three years. Now we followed these patients. Uh, you see here again, the treatment adverse events uh, occurred in both the populations. Serious ones considered related to pegcetacoplin, 6.3 versus 1.9%, so about 4.5%. And Leading to death was low, and none of these were felt to be related to the pegcetacoplin. The most common uh, treatment-related adverse events were consistent with those reported in the initial trials. Hemolysis, and this is an issue with a C3 in inhibitor. As we inhibit C3, we see more PNH red cells surviving, and if a complement activating event comes along, uh, they can get a fairly brisk hemolytic event. Uh, and then COVID-19, diarrhea, headache, nasopharyngitis, seemingly similar with other complement inhibitors. Um, breakthrough hemolysis events occurred, and this just shows you the numbers here. 28.8% uh, in the Pegasus had a breakthrough hemolysis, 30% in the Prince population. So somewhere around 30% had an episode of breakthrough hemolysis. Some of these were uh, twice the events. Meningitis, again, you see here being very, very low, zero in these studies. 
thrombotic events occurring in three patients on Pegasus, none on Prince. So they can still occur. Uh, as I mentioned, most of these AEs were, of infections were mild to moderate and non-serious. And thrombotic events occurred mostly in the context of other comorbidities or in one patient after discontinuation. In Tacopan, we have some results for, again, presented at ASH uh, by Dr. Rizitana um, from the uh, apply and appoint studies. Again, classical breakthrough hemolysis maybe being a little bit better compared to uh, those with, on the uh, anti-C5 arm, 3.2 and 8.2%, but they still occur. So I, I can't say that we know for sure that it's going to be truly lower uh, by blocking uh, factor uh, B um, as opposed to C3 or C5. Um, all the breakthrough events were mild to moderate in severity and resolved at, without iptacopan discontinuation. So we can continue and hopefully the events will resolve. One patient did receive a single dose of eculizumab. Three patients had, again, major vascular events or thrombotic events during the APPLY trial. They show the rates here which was fairly low, 0.04%. Uh, so again, having uh, thrombotic events being fairly low in this one, the MAVE was considered to be unrelated to tacopan, uh, and the treatment was continued. Um, after 48 weeks, again, the safety profile was very consistent. It didn't change a lot. Again, these same things that we were seeing with all the other complement inhibitors seemed to come through, breakthrough hemolysis in six patients. So no serious infections. One of the things we were concerned about by targeting the proximal pathway were not really occurring, especially with uh, meningitis or these encapsulated organisms. There's been no adverse events leading to treatment discontinuations. And at least for Iptacopan, there were no deaths. Uh, Denicopan, I show some of the stuff here. Uh, again, the numbers are small for Denicopan right now. Um, so it's hard to say. Uh, what's going to happen with it. But I think we can conclude, again, the same sort of things we were seeing before. Pharyngitis, upper respiratory tract infections um, uh, were, are going to be seen with this drug also. And again, remember, this is going to be combined with a C5 inhibitor uh, when it does come out. Um, so conclusions, denicapan is generally well tolerated, no new safety concerns, most common tra treatment emergent adverse events were these same things we were seeing with other drugs. Uh, and so nothing new uh, that I can say is coming out of the Dinicampan data to distinguish these drugs. So I'll conclude by saying I think these drugs are very safe. I think we still have to consider the, ep the episodes of hemolysis in these. Thrombotic events seem to be very rare in all of them, so they really have worked quite well. So if you inhibit complement effectively, you do not see the same number of thrombotic events that we saw prior to complement inhibition. Uh, and I think patient outcomes are going to improve because of that. I'll just quickly go over my last uh, cases here since we're running out of time. Uh, patient C is a patient who presented in January with shortness of breath and heavy menstrual periods, was found to be pancytopenic. And her workup, uh, as was mentioned before, showed aplastic anemia. She had a very nice response to immunotherapy. And then uh, several years later, she developed fatigue and was quite anemic. She had a bone marrow biopsy, which was normal cellular, so it was not aplastic anemia. And her peripheral blood flow cytometry was positive for PNH. She was started on eculizumab and did somewhat well with it, but was still having problems. They actually sent her for evaluation for bone marrow transplant because she remained anemic and was still requiring transfusions. Transplanter said she wasn't really a candidate. Um, her dose of eculizumab was increased. And then uh, she was sent to us. We noticed a high retic count in her a moderate elevation LDH, a high bilirubin, and we thought she was likely having extravascular hemolysis. And she was actually entered on the initial uh, Pegasus clinical trial uh, with PEGC to Coplan, and she has done wonderful with that, normalized hemoglobin. Uh, she's been continuing on commercial product, and I'm continuing to watch her, and she's doing very well. Uh, second case is a patient who had PNH diagnosed in 1995, initially treated with steroids intermittently. Uh, she was started on eculizumab on the, uh, I think she was actually on the Shepherd trial. Uh, she had a great response, but then started developing marked hemolysis, likely again from C3 deposition on her red cells, requiring transfusions monthly. And she was placed on the uh, Apellus phase one clinical trial of Pegsy to Copeland. 
She did well on this drug until she became pregnant while on the clinical trial, had to come off study. She was put back on a C5 inhibitor, actually had a healthy child delivered, and was eventually placed back on pegcetocopelin when it became commercially available. She's now had some emphasis of breakthrough hemolysis and has been treated with several days in a row of pegcetocopelin. Also had to be given steroids occasionally for these breakthrough events. And we actually started her on compassionate use of tacopan in May and of last year. And she's done better on this with a hemoglobin of 12.9 uh, LDH. That's in normal range for us. Platelets are still running a little bit low. Just a couple of follow-up questions here. First, uh, Eileen, any thoughts or comments on uh, Carlos's presentation cases? Anything you want to add? No, I think the emergence of the alternative pathway inhibitors is a, a major breakthrough in PNH. The big problem is what happens when these patients break through when they're on one of these yeah. new drugs, and that's still a matter of debate. <laughs> so... Um, I think that that, um, that is of concern, and there were a lot of breakthroughs on the PEG, on peg plan, and there have been breakthroughs on the uh, Iptacopan as well. Uh, you know, when they designed these trials, they really didn't think about having a plan in place. And some of the plans that have been proposed are unworkable. Um, others, um, you have to remember that that it, it, maybe not in Europe, but in, in the U.S., we have to navigate the insurance industry, and just adding another drug is not an easy process. And um, it takes a lot of effort, and you got to jump through a lot of hoops to go from one drug to another drug or to add the drug. So I think that's problematic, and um, I think, you know, one of the things that... Uh, I was at a recent meeting. The idea is that we should develop some strategies on how to treat these patients and how to uh, rescue these patients, et cetera. So um, I think so that a, that's a, important. A sort of a practical question to you, Alexander. If uh, curvolumab becomes available, or just assuming if it were available, you had easy access to it, um, and what situations, if any, would you use it right now, Alexander? I think it's still it would be an option for patients who are on other C5 inhibitors and are doing well and have a normal or near normal hemoglobin. So it, it, it reduces the burden of treatment, as I said. And um, I think um, this could be a nice option for, for those patients or maybe for patients to start with, uh, with a sub-Q treatment. Um, also easier to use and um, and less less um, burden of of the treatment, and and I think what some patients mention is, um, and maybe we don't have this in our mind of physicians. We, we have to go to the hospital every day, but for a patient, if you or for a normal person, to say I have to disclose that you have to have a lifelong IV treatment and you have to go to to a center um, every four, two or every eight weeks. I think it's still something, and, and it affects somehow your life. And having an, a sub Q treatment at home, you can. Uh, get your routine and and do that every four weeks and um, and and you don't have to do anything and you don't uh, you can make your appointment with your doctor anytime you want to. It's still clearly advantage and this was for me clear from the beginning, and I think that's something we have to uh, consider. And again, it's it's all up to it's getting more up to the patient what they want and what fits best to their lifestyle. And um, so I think that's, it's, it creates, it's a great option for patients. Eileen? Let me ask Alexander, would you still see the immune complexing if you started with crevolumib? Do you still see that? Or is no, it just no, no. when no, you're the, going? No, the, the, it's, it's not, it's nothing, it's not a feature of crevolumib. It's just the switching of C5 anti right. so uh, antibodies. If you're on a different C5 inhibitor, but not yeah. if you treat them up front, 
with crevalumab. No, you do, you don't see it with upfront. Right. So it's not it's not a feature of crevalumab itself, but it's switching uh, of antibodies. And it, I think it's interesting. And and here it was a great job to to go into details because this could be relevant for other diseases like cold or gluten disease, where you have antibodies with different targets and you have this formation of these immune complexes. And I think. For hematologists, we are used to those to, for the, to the management of immune complexes we see with patients after a ATG treatment and so on. I think that's not nothing really to worry about, uh, but but it's important to know and to be aware of it. And probably just one so, comment from my, maybe from my side in respect of the risk for meningococcal infections. What, what our strategy is uh, is I mean, and, and, and that those infections they were typically not meningitis but uh, severe septicemia, and uh, what we recommend is to have a standby antibiotic treatment. And I think this goes back to the initial trials, where patients had the uh, option to take ciprofloxacin, for example, um, if they have signs and symptoms of a severe infections like fever, and to and then to see the doctor with their with their emergency card. I think that's something which has um, worked out really practically. All my patients with complement inhibitors have uh, like uh, a small emergency box where they carry their cyprofloxacin with them all the time and can uh, intervene uh, as soon as possible. I think that's just a practical thing which I think is is it, it's helpful for patients on complement inhibition. So uh, if I could just ask one more brief question. Just uh, taking a deep breath. I'm just kind of curious. I'll start with you, Carlos. Any thoughts uh, or suggestions in terms of the way we approach this today? Uh, and please be very candid in terms of, you know, whether or not maybe there are some things we could have done better. Or I'm just curious, have you seen this sort of approach that we took today, particularly the way we approached in the beginning in other programs? Have, any other ways that you've seen effective ways to get, particularly to this audience? Any thoughts, Carlos? Well, my thoughts would be, no, this has been a, a very interesting group of uh, patients in the treatments that have evolved. I mean, we've learned things that we, as we've gone along, uh, you know, when we developed uh, C5 inhibition, uh, we weren't thinking that thrombotic rates would go down. That was kind of an afterthought. We weren't uh, uh, thinking we would have extra astral hemolysis in any ways. And now you look at it and say, oh, well, that was obvious. Um, and, you know, now that we're moving into the proximal inhibitors, again, the concern was, would these be safe? And the safety data that's emerging looks like, yeah, it's not only safe, but these may be better targets in terms of outcomes, in terms of hemoglobin uh, levels and uh, fatigue levels. Um, but they're still leaving the issue open of, of how do we handle breakthrough hemolysis, as was mentioned, and will we come up with better strategies for that? So so I think it's exciting. I think it's been a, a very nice model. Uh, I will tell you that, uh, you know, you look at, at what's happened in this field, the, the survival rates in addition to just symptomatology have improved dramatically. And it's hard to find a drug that does that uh, when you look at the hemonc field, uh, maybe the TKIs with CML, but um, nothing uh, that compares to this. I, I was sort of flashing on ruxolitinib for uh, myelofibrosis, the stories that I heard when it first came out. When you were describing some of your patients, I was kind of thinking, I don't know if it sounded like a lot of these people really had fairly rapid improvement in quality of life. Or you see, That's what you're seeing. Yeah. 